Good evening. I'm Robert Newman. I'm the president and director of the National Humanities Center, and I am delighted to welcome all of you here to our first public lecture of 2017. It will be a Shakespearean lecture. We are so delighted that Kim Hall has just landed here at the center this week that we decided to give her a baptism by fire and put her right in front of you. <laughs> Professor Kim Hall received her PhD in 16th and 17th century English literature from the University of Pennsylvania, and she began her career as a member of the English department at Georgetown. Um, in 2001, she moved to Fordham, where she served as chair of literature, and in 2007, she assumed her current role as Lucille Hook Chair of English and Professor of Africana Studies at Barnard College. Her writings on race and gender have established her as an important voice among Renaissance scholars. Her first book, Things of Darkness, Economies of Race and Gender in Early Modern England, which used a black feminist approach to interpret Renaissance literature, helped to launch the field of early modern race studies. And her recent work on the roles of race, aesthetics, and gender in the Anglo-Caribbean sugar trade during the 17th century continues to outline important paths for further scholarly inquiry, drawing connections between imperialism, slavery, sexual politics, and cultural production across the Atlantic world. Professor Hall has also made substantial contributions as an innovative teacher and leader, helping to establish Barnard's Department of Africana Studies and to create the digital Shanghai, Shanghai Project, a pedagogical resource built on the archives of author and feminist icon Entezanki uh, Shanghai. And in 2016, she was named as one of 25 women making a difference in higher education and beyond by diverse issues in higher education. She is the past chair of the Shakespeare Division of the Modern Language Association and a former trustee of the Shakespeare Association of America. She's received numerous fellowships from the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the ACLS, and has joined us this spring as a fellow at the center where she's working on her next project, which considers how one of Shakespeare's most compelling tragic figures has shaped thinking about blackness since he first appeared nearly 400 years ago. This evening, she shares some of that work with us in her talk, Othello was my grandfather, race and Shakespeare in the African diaspora. Please welcome Professor Kim Hall. That was such a beautiful introduction. It's probably the best thing you're here tonight, but I'll do it. So um, I want to thank the center for the invitation to share this work in progress. And it really is a work in progress. I've been thinking about Othello for a long time, but this project just came together in the past like year and a half. And I just started redoing kind of deep research on it at the Schomburg Center last semester. Um, so I'm really deeply grateful for the opportunity to share this work in progress in the most glorious surroundings, as well as to have the time to think about what I've been finding in the archives that I'm looking at. And I'm also thankful to the fellows who have given the new girl such a warm welcome and the staff who kind of got me settling really quickly, especially Marie, who's not here, but she has been on the money with anything I needed in the past week that I've been here. So um, also my dissertation advisor, Maureen Quilligan. Uh, Maureen, I didn't see where you sat. Maureen Quilligan is back there. And I have to give her deep and eternal thanks. Um, Maureen, um, you know, she's the reason I stayed in graduate school. You know, she uh, saw my rough hewn attempts at scholarship and decided there was something there she could work with. And she was also, and I'm more and more grateful for this the more I teach, she was so opening, open to hearing my kind of at that point inchoate thoughts about race and the Renaissance, which a lot of people weren't working on. And so she really helped me kind of think through and refine things so that they were, you know, uh, reachable, they could reach out to an academic audience. So for for better or for worse, it's on you. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, so I began this project with a proposition that will seem obvious to some and perhaps needlessly contentious to others. 
And that is that people of color, particularly black people, are not free to love Shakespeare. Our relationship to Shakespeare is frequently managed, I dare say policed, both by those who love him and those who see him as an agent of cultural dom domination. In this time of political urgency, and in this state, North Carolina, where the eyes of, our, of the country have been for a while on your fight for democracy and equality, from the early Moral Mondays campaign to the most recent fight against the coup in the state legislature, it would be understandable for anyone in this room to ask, what does your free love of Shakespeare matter? Why care about the suspicion that greets blackness in the world of Shakespeare when people of color every day walk out of their homes in this free country to face suspicion and potential violence? And in full disclosure, I gave an early part of this talk at the Folger Shakespeare Library this summer, and now that feels like it happened in another life, um, particularly this week. And I'll further confess that since November, I've had recurring bouts of despair about our future, about feminism, and about the larger purpose of work on Shakespeare. However, at the same time, I've also been feeling like that impulse that drove me a couple years ago to say that I need to look more closely at black Shakespeareans post-slavery and post-reconstruction, um, that that would serve me well. And it has, because I see in their, diff in their um, struggle the kind of difficulties we face in our immediate future. And so now I'm enjoying this luxury of having spent time in the archive with black people who struggled to perform Shakespeare against enormous odds. And I'm inspired by black feminist Bell Hooks's sense that speaking our yearnings might be the beginning of some sort of coalition. She says of her early book yearning, I thought of our passion, passionate collective longing for peace and justice. Thinking that our yearning might serve as a united, uniting force, I wanted to make the longings of our hearts tied to the quest for freedom. And the performance I'm researching, I think that yearning to perform Shakespeare is also that quest for freedom. I hope to demonstrate some of Shakespeare's role in racial formation in this country and the resultantly, resultantly profound relationship between Shakespeare and black freedom. I hope um, in the next 40 minutes to convince you that uh, dismantling some of our long-held shibboleths about Shakespeare, being less suspicious of perceived challenges to Shakespeare, and forging a new relationship between Shakespeare and blackness are essential to having Shakespeare, a Shakespeare usable for the next 400 years, you know, if we last that long. So, um, <laughs> well, I am not, and most of us won't, but somebody will. Um, I have spent most of my academic life, as you heard from the introduction, in two worlds. The world of Renaissance and Shakespeare studies to which certain values are attached, genius, universality, transcendence, and timelessness, and the world of Af black African-American cultural production, more associated with emotion, embodiment, particular forms of genius, but also with trouble and disruption. Thus, for over 20 years, and you know, don't correct me, I have lived in the heart of canonical knowledge in the U.S. and at its most influential margins. I see almost daily the complicated differences between the authority allowed or denied to people of color, even over our own experiences, and the authority and value attributed to white cultural artifacts, often without scrutiny. I began my career during an early phase of what we call the culture wars of the 1990s, when many scholars concerned with race, Shakespeare, and cultural politics pushed the academy to question what forms of exclusion scholars enact when they insist on a transcendent, ahistorical Shakespeare. Oh, I was supposed to move this. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, when they insist on a transcendent ahistorical Shakespeare who is universal, a fixed, unchanging point. That Shakespeare was seen as needing protection, particularly from the disruptive hard questions that politically conscious blackness presses on dominant culture and an insistence that people of color be given a place in the American classroom. The culture wars around Shakespeare since that time seem to have re receded a bit in the face of actual war and the dismantling of education and the arts, but there are signs of resurgence, and I do think that we will see more of it in, in the years to come. This winter, black students at my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, caused a social media stir by covering up the giant image of Shakespeare that hangs in the Shakespeare Law Department, which hung there when Maureen and I were there, and replacing it with a picture of uh, feminist poet Audre Lorde. So the divergent values between Shakespeare and blackness live on. Most of the time, I just live with these contradictions, moving between the amiably fraught world of Shakespeare studies and the world of African diaspora studies between Shakespeare and Audre Lorde. However, the question of freedom, uh, yeah. 
I'm gonna move on to that. However, the question of freedom that propels us in, in black studies made me reverse course in my own research from a historically driven, when some could say Shakespeare driven approach, which is meant uh, moving from researching how questions of, Shakespeare, of race mattered in Shakespeare's day to a more diasporic focus, which is to locate Shakespeare and how black writers theorize and represent race. Thus, my new project uses Othello to recover black experiences of Shakespeare and to explore contemporary questions of race. Othello has a particular relationship to African-American history in the African diaspora. As the 1995 play, The Moor's Fortune claims, we have wallowed in the ocean of Othello's legacy. At the moment, I have over 40 artworks. I actually think I have closer to 50, but I haven't recounted yet, ranging from poetry to dramas, so you can see them up on the screen, to visual arts and comedies that all attest to Othello's hold on black culture. So tonight, um, I'm not actually talking about any of them, but <laughs> I'm going to offer you two examples of encounters between Shakespeare and race from the 18th and 19th centuries that engage slavery, freedom, and questions of genealogy or lineage. And I use those terms alternatively, and I'm, at some point I've got to sit down and think about, think through which ones I'm going to stick with. So the first will be uh, from W.B. Du Bois and his uh, grandfather, Othello Burkhardt, and the second, Richard Barry Harrison. Um, those of us in the Shakespeare business have just emerged from a year of global celebration of Shakespeare's quadricentennial. As someone who comes to you from two worlds, I can't celebrate Shakespeare's 400 years of survival and success without thinking about the 400 years of black history with which he is deeply intertwined. In these 400 years, albeit in fits and starts, Shakespeare has grown in value as a cultural commodity, which is to say he remains a way to identify other objects of value. For example, in order to convey the personal presence and stature of Pulitzer Prize winner Toni Morrison, the New York Times notes, quote, Morrison wears her age like an Elizabethan regent or a descendant of Othello via Lorraine, Ohio. The paper strains to imagine her as somehow related to Shakespeare, if only through a character who had no children in his, you know, completely fictional life. In those, same oh, in those same 400 years, black people dispersed from Africa into the New World also become a source of value, but as literal commodities brought in chains to different sites of the New World and as ideological property, our blackness used, particularly on the stage, as the means by which masses of Americans, both white and becoming white, could establish a positive and superior sense of identity. Like Othello, we have done the state some service. In that dual history, the universal Shakespeare has served the same purpose as many representations of black people, to maintain a sense of mastery, of, of mastery and superiority for one group over another. Early in Othello, the villain Iago describes himself using the enigmatic phrase, I am not what I am. Frequently in popular arenas, Shakespeare is not who he is. When you hear the word Shakespeare, it might mean several things, which I've broken down into four elements. So one, the historical person, the living Shakespeare, a playwright and entrepreneur who drew upon the energies of his day and the newly hatching theatrical culture of Elizabethan England to create incredible plays. The texts that come to us from that era that were the byproduct of Shakespeare's energetic collaborations and competition with his fellow writers and actors. Then there's the accumulated baggage of 400 years of cultural conversation and scholarship that trains us in ways subtle and not how to think and speak about Shakespeare. And then finally, and it was hard to find an image for this, Shakespeare is a metaphor for Englishness or white European culture. The first two Shakespeare's are quirky, brilliant, boisterous, bawdy, and beautiful. The last two are to be spoken of in hushed tones as if the stage was a cathedral rather than an entertainment space on the fringes of London, often shared with bear baiting, and his text, Holy Writ. In this latter sense, performing Shakespeare can be an empowering point of entry into theater and American society more generally. However, as scholar Anya Lumba notes, laying claim to the universal Shakespeare can also reinforce the authority of dominant culture. It can stabilize or assert the power and value of whiteness rather than acting in concert with multiple cultural formations. Whenever you hear the phrase black Shakespeare, which you will many times tonight, I want you to see it like this. Imagine that small space between Black and Shakespeare as that 400 years of a history that largely denied Blacks access to the structures, particularly education and the theater, that generally shape relations to Shakespeare. The slash re represents that wounded past and division, 
what W.E.B. Du Bois famously called the color line, which he identified as the problem of the 20th century. And it turns out he was understating the case. Our relations to Shakespeare both are part of and represent a larger struggle for black freedom, not the freedom to be included and tolerated in white institutions on their terms, but the freedom in a democracy to have institutions that nourish and represent the diversity of our society. Unsurprisingly, black writers through the years have grappled with questions of authority and universality in black life using evocations of Shakespeare. For example, The Souls of Black Folk it, um, gives us a famous invocation of Shakespeare when it creates a vision ooh, sorry, of black intellectual life beyond what Du Bois called the veil of double consciousness. I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out the caves of evening that swing between the strong-limbed earth and the tracery of the stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they all come graciously with no scorn and condescension. So wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. In the now famous phrase, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not, Du Bois offers a powerful vision of the future, one in which educated blacks and the writers who embody our rich cultural heritage mingle on equal footing and without restraint, blending in with the long acknowledged arbiters of history, philosophy, and literature. Shakespeare's wince, a metaphor for the ways in which Shakespeare and Anglo-American culture have been used to belittle and stifle black creativity, is replaced with quiet acceptance. No Shakespeare play embodies black struggles over authority and inclusion more than Othello. In act one, the play begins with a comic structure, a black general seemingly accepted into Venetian society, woos and then elopes with Desdemona, the white daughter of a disapproving Venetian senator. However, after the marriage is approved by the Duke, by the Venetian Duke and the lovers move to the battlegrounds of Cyprus, the play becomes fully tragic. Othello's love is stimulated into jealousy and murderous rage by Iago, a soldier passed over by promotion. The play ends, oh, what did I do here? Sorry. Oh, sorry. The play ends when Othello murders his wife and then himself asking or saying, speak of me as I am, nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. Then you must speak, speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well. The play seemingly offers a place of entry. Who better than black Americans to understand the constant sense of judgment, the suspicion that accompanies being an outsider? Who better to feel the story of a black man with a singular relationship to the state, whose gifts of strength and eloquence let him temporarily cross, cross the boundaries of an insular world? His desire to have his unmediated story, to have others in his words speak of me as I am in the aftermath of tragedy is a paradoxically powerful cry for people who are too often spoken for and about others and about by others. However, this sense of kinship and understanding is vexed both because of the story and because of the, the uh, stage history. The Othello of Act One is noble and eloquent. However, he is also painfully naive. And of course, later, he's the murderer of his innocent wife. Most important to talk about the stage history of Othello is to talk about the staging of blackness and to always be aware of the historical relationship in America between performance and black denigration. For many years, America's best known contribution to popular performance history was black space minstrelsy, where as Arrow Hill notes, whites were trained to see black bodies only as a source of ridicule. To claim or, re or to reject Othello is to immerse oneself in the history of race and black stigmatization. And I'll say that kind of that I, I'm increasingly coming to the claim that removing oneself from that history of minstrelsy is a key part of both white and black performance of Othello from 18th century uh, till now uh, in some ways. So my first example is Othello Burghardt. Um, I drew my project title, Othello Was My Grandfather, an inspiration from this W.E.B. Du Bois quote because genealogy is a key means by which African-American theorists explain the workings of race in the U.S. And Du Bois's family suggests the complicated ways in which blacks inhabit Othello, both the play and the person. In Dusk of Dawn, an essay towards, the auto, towards an autobiography of a race concept, Du Bois reminds his readers that it is not his white ancestors who he says were quite lost and indeed unknown, but the black Burkharts who set the parameters of his American existence. Quote, I was brought up with the Burkhart clan and this fact determined my life and quote unquote race. 
Du Bois's family tree suggests that a century before he struggled with theorizing American racialism, his ancestors had their own encounters with Shakespeare and a complicated picture emerges, or I'm gonna make a complicated picture out of it, that's more so to say. Um, uh, Othello was a name given mockingly to the properties of slave society. So here, for example, is a partial list of slaving voyages by the New England ship Othello. And there's also a slave an advertisement for a runaway slave Othello. Also, Othello was the last black man hung in the numerous trials and executions related to the New York conspiracy of 1741, also known as the Negro Plot. A series of fires in Lower Manhattan led to rumors of a citywide attempt to burn the island and kill all the ruling whites. Governing authorities resorted to a massive interrogation of enslaved Africans and poor whites on the colonies in its virulence equated to the Salem Rich trials, even by contemporaries. This Othello might have been the Negro boy Othello auctioned off from the New York governor John Montgomery's estate and listed in the same property inventory as Montgomery's The Complete Works of Shakespeare. So at the top is the page with Othello, the boy, and at the next the inset is The Complete Works of Shakespeare that was sold in that same auction. Um, let's see, yeah. Um, I'll leave that for a minute. It is not surprising to find Othello amongst the ranks of enslaved black men. Elevated, grandiose sounding names from literature and classical history like Cato, Pompey, and Caesar were a recurring joke for slaveholders, a way of reinforcing white mastery literally every time they addressed an enslaved man. However, this history and Othello the character's paradoxical status makes Othello a strange choice for a free people, especially for the Burghards who seemingly paid careful attention to family names and family history. For example, Du Bois's great-grandmother reputedly refused to take her husband's slave name in favor of her chosen name, Freeman. So what does this name mean for them? On one hand, the name Othello might indelibly mark the dilemma of being black in a white world, a dilemma Othello's grandson would spend a century exploring. In that sense, the name marks the, his and the family's marginality and liminal place in the American story. On the other hand, the name might claim the family's sense of centrality in the story of Western culture. Othello, in this case, moves from being fictive to actual kin, from black property, uh, black property through kinship, not slavery. Du Bois makes the historical fact of his grandfather's name a sign to readers of the complicated legacies of blackness in, in the US, that race shapes your birth and circumstances in America, and that grappling with he, what he called our lost and indeed unknown history is a necessary task for American survival. But I'm also playing with a third possibility. Living in neighboring Massachusetts, perhaps Othello's father, Jacob, the son of the formerly enslaved Tom Burkhart knew the story of the New York conspiracy and the wronged Othello better than he knew the play Othello. And I, um, I cut out some of this, but there, Othello was known to his interrogators a particularly upstanding and well-known um, slave. And so he was, they asked for a pardon, but since he was owned by a very prominent man, he couldn't, they, they couldn't um, give him a pardon. And they, the compromise with they was that they hung him rather than burned him at the stake. My other example um, is the career of Afro-Canadian actor Richard Barry Harrison. Um, Shylock, rather than Othello, is his touchstone character, and I'm still putting together what I'm learning about his life. I knew he existed, but in the Schomburg, um, I found so much that was fascinating to me about him that I, he kind of diverted me a little bit. And he has such an important connection to North Carolina that it seemed really appropriate to revisit his story here. Um, at North Carolina AT and A and T State University, he created a summer program, one of the first in the country for teachers of theater arts, and he remained on the faculty until his death. The university's collegiate theater group, the Richard Barry Harrison Players, was named after him. So I'm hoping while I'm here to visit his archive in Greensboro. And he does have one pretty, to me, amazing encounter with, with over Othello. Um, oh, yeah, we're going to go and stay here. At age 66, Harrison became famous playing God or the Lord. And I have been working on my families from North Carolina, but I've lost a lot of, you know, don't have the accent. So I really need it to, to pronounce this play, the, his, his character in this play, but I'm working on it. So um, he became famous playing God in the Broadway play Green Pastures. And with apologies to James Earl Jones and Morgan Freeman, he was, seems to be the original black actor with the voice of God. Um, theater requires resources, space, people, money. 
Lacking most of these elements, black actors of Harrison's time became readers or elocutionists and created their own Shakespeare performances, reciting key speeches from the plays or performing truncated versions as one man shows. Harrison's acclaim came years after traveling alone in the often dangerous circumstances in the life of an itinerant elocutionist, primarily of Shakespeare and Dunbar, and drama teacher with stints as a porter, insurance agent, and hotel waiter, apart from just the dangers of traveling alone as a black man through a lot of unknown territory. Um, and so in his... Um, in the aftermath of his fame, he, he's uh, kind of proclaimed as a Shakespeare uh, elocutionist, but pretty unknown until then. Amongst the 90-person cast of the play, many of whom were children, Harrison is given credit for elevating the drama into wild popularity. It ran for five years, including two Broadway runs, and won the writer a Pulitzer Prize. I'm just fascinated by this map. I don't know if you can see it, but right on the map, right above where it says Green Pastures on tour, it says no Negroes, no Negro interest. I you know, don't know what that means, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Be, and, and, and which is it's particularly striking because from all accounts that I've read, it was a play popular across races. So why all of a sudden there's no need, to, if white people are only interested if they're Negroes in their midst, I don't know. Um, so, but anyway, um, uh, within a year of, of the play's opening, Harrison became the second actor to be awarded the NAACP Spring Arn Medal, not simply for that role, but for, quote, the long years of his work as a dramatic reader and entertainer, interpreting to the mass of colored people in church and school the finest specimens of English drama from Shakespeare down. Harrison's religiosity, personal humility, perseverance, and dedication to racial uplift became as much a part of the story as his acting. He died um, almost literally on, uh, on in backstage. Thousands of thousands packed his funeral at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City, while even more. Oh, I'm missing a page, but okay. Well, anyway, well, even more packed outside. And the estimates run from 7,000 to a pretty improbable 35,000. Um, so you can see here the pictures of his, the, um, of his funeral. And also one of the things I'm interested in, but I haven't really had a time to think about, which is what the NHC is for, is that the accounts of him in the black press are so surrounded with accounts of violence and it seems as if they're kind of using his popularity to bring attention to um, you know uh, violence on on college campuses on race riots on all other kinds of, of kind of unrest so but in the time left I want to um, oh I know sorry. Errol Hill, who wrote the seminal book Shakespeare and Sable, concludes his brief discussion of Harrison's career evocatively, evocatively, su evocatively suggesting the huge impediments the Shakespeare stage holds for black actors. He says, Richard B. Harrison was not allowed to play Shakespeare on Broadway, but he died playing God. Oh. <laughs> Um, in the time left, I want to focus on the differences between the way Shakespeare, the many Shakespeare's I introduced you to earlier, appears in Harrison's life as given by the white press and in his own telling of his life. And I should say there are multiple Shakespeare stories in his biography, the source of his name, the first time he read Shakespeare, the first time he performed Shakespeare. But for time, I'm only focusing on the story of his name, which has a lot of different levels. Um, for the former, for the white press, I primarily use a really long obituary that appeared in the New York Herald Tribune, which contains all of the key Shakespeare anecdotes that appear in the press coverage of Green, Pas Green Pastures. And for the latter, his unpublished autobiography, Even Plain the Lord, uh, written with Olive Jeter. In white accounts, much is name of the, made of his name Richard, seemingly after Shakespeare's Richard III, while Harrison's hard-earned training as an actor, and oh, sorry, that was another um, uh, thing. Oh, yeah. Um, while Harrison's hard-earned training as an actor and long history performing Shakespeare in black churches, schools, and, and what we'd call pop-up settings now um, is often erased. And so here, for example, the paper claims Richard B. Harrison of Green Pastures had never been on the stage, <laughs> um, despite his you know, 40 years of performing. At the same time, the black press claims that he was discovered while trying to recruit actors for an all-black Merchant of Venice. In the white press, his relationship to Shakespeare emerges as a mystery that needs to be solved and as the solution to his distinct lack of a theatrical lineage in an era when such performance genealogies were a common means of creating celebrity. In his own accounts, 
I see Harrison balancing his affinity for Shakespeare with a story of black freedom. He produces a love of the Shakespeare text and performance, so Shakespeare one and two, while refusing the legacy of the minstrel stage and a life Shakespeare, uh, shaped by Shakespearean uplift, so Shakespeare's three and four. The fourth child of fugitive slaves living in London, Canada, Harrison is depicted as almost literally born to a life on the stage. And this is from the Herald Tribune. Before long, the Negroes of London became interested in the idea of starting a colony of their own in Haiti, and Mr. and Mrs. Harrison migrated there. But the plan turned out disappointingly, and the young couple returned to London, stopping in New York, where Mrs. Harrison is supposed to have insisted upon splurging in the sole luxury of seeing Edwin Booth play Richard III. The child who was to become the Lord was born soon after that and received his full name, and I want to emphasize that, Richard, in honor of Shakespeare's famous character. This story connects Harrison to black and white theater history on multiple levels. Ah, dog on it. Booth, a member of the famous English acting family, toured the U.S. performing Shakespeare. And this is a career Harrison's autobiography implies that he could have had if he'd agreed to pass for white or foreign. And established the first modern theater in New York. And so that's a playbill from one of his final performances. Richard III, long a favorite on the 19th century American stage, was also a favorite uh, of black, black performers and audiences. As just one example, in 1820, the first black theater, the African Grove, staged a production of Richard, Richard III on the same street as the established white uh, park theater's production. The park theater's owner hired white thugs who first heckled and then started to riot at the black performance so that the police would have to come and shut it down. So the Herald Tribune's naming, account of Harrison's naming, smooths out the racial conflict and competition that adheres to uh, Richard III's stage history. Likewise, when it gives the mother's story, the paper continually, continually minimizes black aspiration. For example, it describes her escape from slavery thusly. The actor's mother was a small Negro woman who had waited on the elegant ladies of the famous Chowtow family in St. Louis. As their slave, she accompanied them to the theater and the opera and spoke French fluently, though she knew very little English. She was treated well, but tired of the life of a servant. The mother who left slavery because she got tired of it um, is at odds with the woman who made the difficult move from legal freedom. I'm glad you caught that. Um, legal freedom in Canada to greater self-determination in Haiti. The idea that she became tired of servitude echoes that Uncle Tom like patients flagged in articles headline. And there's actually another article that I was not able to photograph that has a that proclaims that Harrison knew the real Uncle Tom. Um, the paper makes it clear that the mother's attraction to Shakespeare is part of a larger sense of luxury and elegance that she inherited from her former owners. In contrast to these stories of inheritance that suggest culture and refinement are derived from sh uh, Shakespeare in proximity to whites and slavery, Harrison's autobiography posits that his most important maternal inheritance, inheritance for his career was, the le was less the name Richard itself than her self-reliance and desire for autonomy and success. Even playing the Del Lord tells a different story of the role of Shakespeare in his life. In e each instance, he gives the Shakespeare, he gives some version of the Shakespeare antidote that you already know from the popular press, but his telling links him to black community, black freedom, and his own tenacious hard work. It opens with a different kind of black performance, his mother singing Freedom's Song. And he says, I can understand now, now why Freedom's Song was such a favorite of my mother. It was an old slave song which inspired many to run away from their masters. The manuscript reprints the song, which is here, noting that it was sung before Queen Victoria by a company of Negroes known as the Canadian Jubilee Singers. The song makes visible a black performance tradition beyond minstrelsy, as well as establishes a family link between freedom and performance. And as I will suggest below, this song and the Jubilee Singers is the first note in his longer tale of yearning and Shakespeare. The reader's given freedom song and the story of the exodus of Negroes from Canada to Haiti before his mother's appearance at Richard III with an unexpected outcome. So here's his naming story. Stopping over in New York, mother saw Booth play Richard III. Her friends attributed the love, um, the love which her next child possessed for dramatics to the effect of the play on her. It happened that I was that next child, born on September 28, 1864, in London, Ontario, on Wellington Street near Nelson. Our little house with the famous cherry tree in the eaves was not far from the River Thames on which the city of London is situated. It seems to me that every city of London is on a River Thames. <laughs> they named me after Richard Berry, 
the wealthiest colored citizen of London. He was an auctioneer and sold his wares in the marketplace. What a strange career, I have often thought, for an ex-slave. Throughout the, uh, the book, Harrison alludes to, then deflates the more grandiose narrative, replacing stories of fortunate, uplifting encounters with Shakespeare in higher class venues with the everyday beauty of a community of striving and successful ex-slaves. He has a Shakespeare, Shakespearean lineage, although it's very quotidian. So his description of his kind of seemingly bucolic life near the Thames evokes both urban and rural Shakespeare, the son of a rural glover who would build a theater company by the Thames in England that made him a reasonably wealthy-ish citizen of London. So the life of an elocutionist is also the life of an itinerant businessman. It is also lonely, the opposite of the communal unpacking of a Shakespearean text in preparation for the stage that, ha that can happen with a professional company. So when, Bear when uh, Harrison moves from London, Canada to Detroit to kind of you know, follow through on his theater ambitions, he talks about this geographical longing, which speaks to the larger f uh, longing for the fullness of a communal theatrical life. And so he says at one point, Nevertheless, I longed for London, my sports with the boys, my newspapers, my theater. Like so many autobiographies of race, where the writer lives primarily in a state of racial innocence until experiencing a visual rejection in a communal activity, Harrison presents his young life as somewhat of a pastoral idol until he encounters a race-based rejection. And he says, and now this matter of race had grown to be very seriously serious. I had ambitions to go on the stage. There was no colored stage except minstrels and jubilee singers. For neither of these did I have any ability. I could not join a white company. I was determined to act. I had studied Macbeth with Mrs. Lambert, had also studied The Merchant of Venice. In fact, I had a head full of goods and no market. In recounting his rejection from the white stage, Harrison returns to language associated with Richard Berry, his black namesake, I had a head full of goods and no market, juxtaposing Berry's freedom as a successful economic actor with his own unfreedom in the theater world. Freedom's song repeated in the opening marks a positive and negative absence, a family tradition of freedom too powerful to allow him to take up the minstrel stage and a musical performance tradition for which he, didn't have, for which he hadn't the right talent. For a man reduced to determination to be, in his words, an all-colored one-man company, there may be a faint touch of envy of the Canadian Jubilee singers who are able to join themselves together as a performing troupe and sing freedom songs in London before the Queen, a distinct contrast to the solitary life of a Shakespeare reader. The preeminence of the black Richard Berry over Shakespeare's Richard III reinforces the through line of the biography, which is a story of dogged overcoming of financial and personal obstacles and a persevering love of theater. Without Ever stating outright, he makes it clear over and over again that his talent and current position as a star of green pastures were due to hard work and circumstance, not to the borrowed lineage from Shakespeare. Throughout, he gives tantalizing glimpses of Shakespeare performance that could ha that Shakespeare performances that could have been. Longing appears, for example, in the missed opportunities for Shakespeare performance. Um, in 1892, when he meets Frederick Douglass and discovers their mutual love of acting. And he says, in St. Paul, I met Frederick Douglass, who was attending the Republican National Convention when it nominated Benjamin Harrison. I was happy to be stopping in the same hotel with Mr. Douglass. He was especially interested in my work and told me it was his greatest ambition to be an actor. He wanted to play Othello. I wonder if the world was not robbed of possibly one of the greatest Othellos the stage has ever seen. For fully a half an hour at a time on several days, he would recite to me scenes between the Moor and Iago. One day he asked me what I thought was the strongest word that Shakespeare had written in any of his plays, and he told me it was the word indeed by Iago. In Harrison's account, at the same time that Douglas was at the convention with other activists bringing attention to record high atrocities and lynchings inflicted on blacks, he was rehearsing, rehearsing a different kind of freedom informally with Harrison. Harrison drives home this love of theater, not simply with the image of Douglas performing both Iago and Othello, so seemingly a one-man troupe in itself, but with a detailed discussion of the text. This tantalizing image of a possible playbill proclaiming Frederick Douglass as Othello is counted among the many robberies of black excellence and reverberates against Harrison's own inability to achieve greatness on the Shakespeare stage. Several of the media's stories about Harrison's life note his response to the oft-asked questions, what roles would you like to play? And uh, they include uh, a range of classical roles, including Sh uh, Shylock. 
It is implied in the Frederick Douglass encounter that his history and attention to Othello would have put Douglass in the pantheon of outstanding actors. But elsewhere, Harrison states that his own experiences of racism would make him a better Shylock of having to play Shylock as a stand-in uh, for an ill student during one of the summer courses, he says, from that experience, I got a new slant on the character as usually portrayed in the play. I tried to cultivate and make a personality out of Shylock different from any I have ever seen. Probably because I am of a race that has been oppressed for many years, that I see Shylock not as a money-loving character with, um, whose greed for cash submerged all other interests, but as a race-loving character with courage to rebut any and all, uh, um, and all other insults. Sorry, with the courage to, to rebut, I'm sorry, any and everything and any and any everybody who tried to oppress or insult him by considering him inferior. After all, maybe my Shylock was a Negro. Harrison's ongoing experience of racial discrimination and his struggles with the economics of the theater and pursuit of his art makes him produce a Shylock who embodies financial success and race pride in the face of adversity, much like his namesake, Richard Berry. So, so I have a conclusion. So, um, and I think I skipped over something. Uh, no. So this, so Harrison, I, I, I actually saw the, the advertisement for Harrison before I knew about this anecdote about Frederick Douglass. I'm like trying to figure out how he met Frederick Douglass, but I was not allowed to take a photograph of it. So he, when he was, before he got to Green Pastures, he had a brochure that he would pass out to kind of gin up business. And these were the two main quotes. He was a very good friend of Paul Lunt's, Paul Lunt's John Barr's as well, whom he met in Detroit. So this is my conclusion. Um, to perform Shakespeare, to read and to study Shakespeare should not feel like crossing the color line. For that to happen, for people to love and enjoy Shakespeare free, freely, he needs to be freed from being white property. And I've just given you a glimpse of the long history of blacks attempting to free themselves and Shakespeare as white property. So too, black distrust of Shakespeare and Othello cannot be dismissed. It has to be accepted as the understandable byproduct of the same 400 years that brought Shakespeare's greatness. I encourage all of you to recognize how cavalierly we throw around Shakespeare's universality and how universality reinforces whiteness. To give up Shakespeare as a metaphor for the greatness of Western culture feels impossible. That universality is a self-perpetuating engine that can direct money to, in access to art, to underperforming schools, to parks, and to prisons. Which means that to save Shakespeare for the next 400 years, we have to save the arts in America more broadly, reaffirming its value in our schools and public life as essential to the goals of diversity and inclusion. Instead of browbeating teachers who don't see Shakespeare as relevant to their students, we need to give them the means to have students experience the stage and have a sense of play and relationship to the text. I hope the black artists I'm studying while I'm here can offer a different path, which is to go back to that quirky, brilliant, boisterous, body and beautiful Shakespeare and the lively theatrical culture from which he emerged. Promoters of the New Negro movement of the 1930s thought it was important to find a black Shakespeare, a genius who would transform vernacular black life into enduring art. A great deal of what black Shakespeareans admired about the bard was not his claim to universal genius, but his ability to elevate vernacular English and to create a vibrant, commercially successful theatrical culture where there was none before. At a time when Shakespeare ascends to high culture status, these black Shakespeareans are reclaiming his roots for projects of racial uplift and for building black institutions. This Shakespeare is a genius of the people. In wanting a black Shakespeare, they didn't want someone who transcended his race, but that rare person who could similarly transform into art the cadences of black life and the multivocality of American speech. For our own time, this might, see, might mean seeing the striking resonances between Shakespeare theatrical culture and black life. In black culture, we find an appreciation of performance, of musicality, of cultural style, of language, and wordplay as rich as Shakespeare's own. This Shakespeare speaks to and includes those who yearn for freedom, including to love, Sha to love Shakespeare as we like it, and the freedom to wince at him when he need to. It is not our access to Shakespeare that marks our freedom. It is our ability to inhabit and use him in our own terms, to offer him our love, but with our drive for freedom and with our difference. Thank you. I went over, but I'll take questions. Uh, Kim has agreed to take some questions. Uh, Brooke Andrade, the director of our library services, is hovering in the back with a microphone. So if you just raise your hand, Brooke will get to you and you can ask your question. Uh, I was interested that you mentioned quite a lot uh, 
uh, the Merchant of Venice, which is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, which is uh, Shakespeare's other Venetian play. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, I wondered if you'd done much research or study of uh, blackness and the interpretation sorry. of. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the phrase you just used, Mike? Yeah. It's okay. Uh, I wonder if you'd done much research into uh, black interpretations of the play itself and also of, of uh, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, because yes. both of which are, seem to be cautionary tales yes. of people uh, being uh, taken into a white society, used, and then spit out. Yes. That they, are the, uh, they aren't the heroes of the place, they are uh, the tragic victims of the stories that they're in. Yes. And, yeah. That might be an interesting uh, yeah. way to consider how we how yeah. we look at uh, at Othello yeah. as a cautionary tale, yes. which may have more to do with Shakespeare's life than his <laughs> understanding of black people. Well, you know, the thing is, the play that becomes who performs it, right? So it's in Shakespeare time, it's, it's to his audience and their concerns, and each successive generation reinvents these plays and rewrites them, you know, for their time. So it doesn't necessarily, Shakespeare doesn't have to necessarily have to have meant what he, you know, you know, what we want and what we make of him now. Um, although some, you know, accuracy would be, be nice. But um, so the, the short answer is no, I haven't done a lot of it or Merchant of Venice because the, the stuff went over Othello is just over I kind of mentioned Merchant of Venice because he's so important to Richard Berry. And I think Richard Berry sees in that play what you see in it, right? That this is another one of these stories. And also, you know, be, be, you know, Barry could, I mean, Harrison couldn't have performed Othello. He's white presenting. So um, to perform a, a dark skinned man would have been kind of beyond. So I, I, I was, I was, when I got to the part with him and Frederick Douglass, like, aha, I knew there'd be Othello in here somewhere. But there's so, the, there's so much Othello that I'm really trying to narrow. I mean, there are other, like I could, you know, you could, um, for, you know, um, looking at black Shakespeare, Richard III, Merchant of Venice, Othello, um, you know, could all, you know, kind of come to the fore. I mean, ap apart from the 45 uh, or so text I have, I started with kind of three um, actors and intellectuals that I was interested in who kind of were kind of activists as well as performers. And then after I came out of Schomburg, I had about 12. And so now, and they all kind of know each other in different ways. So I didn't realize that Arthur, Sch Arthur Schomburg, who founded the Schomburg Center, was um, a member of the Friends of Shakespeare. And he and Robert uh, Bruce, uh, I'm sorry, Johnny e. Bruce, performed Shakespeare in Yonkers. Um, so I'm just finding kind of almost more than I can handle. But you're right that, that Mer Merchant is right up there is with these kind of uh, plays that are really kind of seriously focus on inclusion and Venice is a really important kind of space for that for, for Shakespeare but I think the the lady the beautiful maroon is over here so. thank you um, I grew up doing theater oh okay. I don't do theater anymore. so you know more about theater than I do well I don't I mean, know about yes. that but I grew up doing theater and I always thought how one of the things I loved about Shakespeare was that any race of person could play any character that it was possible for Shakespeare to be, in that sense, right. more universal. Not, yes. not in the white sense, but right, in that right. you could really see Shakespeare's work in, in, in multiple mm -hmm. hues mm -hmm. of human color. Mm -hmm. um, to that end, uh, since you've been in New York for such a long time, <laughs> have you had any uh, relationship with the Harlem Shakespeare Festival, which has been going for about... You mean the classical theater Five, of Harlem? Yeah, yes. classical theater of Harlem I love that's doing them. the summer they Shakespeare. They do, yes, and I, um, yeah, I, the, so the classical theater of Harlem has a summer uh, Shakespeare uh, production that they call the other Shakespeare in the park, and they do, and and I'm actually I um, I'm I'm doing a review of their um, uh, Midsummer. Um, and yes, it was, it was, the Midsummer was fabulous. I could go on and on about them. But one of the things they do that I think is very typical of what I'm calling Black Shakespeare is the, the kind of integration of Black musical styles and dance and movement in all the productions. The Macbeth, the banquet scene in Macbeth was this incredibly like erotic and dangerous um, kind of fantasy sequence that had all this amazing Caribbean dances dancing in it and was um, set in Santo Domingo. So, um, so they're doing 
now what I think, if you look back, even back to Ira Aldrich, who was the first kind of notable um, black actor to achieve, to achieve success on a, on a standard stage, Aldridge in the interact between his performances included black spirituals and also kind of passed the hat for abolitionist causes. So even Aldridge was incorporating music into his performances. So I do think that those are kind of constitutive elements of, of, of black Shakespeare in a kind of major way. But they're amazing. They're free. It, unlike uh, the, 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 the Shakespeare in Central Park, you can almost walk right in. The first time I took friends, they're like, so should we meet an hour early? And I'm like, no, no, just get there you know, 20, 15 minutes early, find your seat. Um, it's sadly um, undersubscribed. And they, they did their Midsummer the same year that Julie Taymor's Midsummer, And I was so appalled. I mean, it's visually stunning. It's also visually quite racist. And I was so appalled by the money that got poured into her in that production while they're literally up in Harlem passing the hat with some of the most fabulous actors you'll see in New York. So thank you for bringing it up because yes, go to New York, see them. It's usually in late June, early July. And it's usually cool. Hey Kim, thanks so hey, much. Man. That was electric. I, I really loved it. Um, I, uh, I was wondering, um, could you say a little bit about the sort of talk a little bit, I was thinking about your title, which is, which is you know, so <laughs> grabbing. And I was, could you talk a little bit about the sort of temporal gener generational truncation, right? Yes, so, I mean, on the one hand, right, of course, like literally Othello is his grandfather, right? But yeah. on the other hand, I guess I'm wondering about what does it mean to kind of make kinship, right, across time, right, in the context right. of, of slavery, right, where, of course, like, you know, <laughs> kinship bonds are, are shattered so. um, and erased and effaced, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I'm curious about these, these gestures of kinship making mm -hmm. um, and, and the kind of like uh, affective charge of that or yeah. how you're kind of understanding that in terms of making kinship with the character. Like, do you see this as a kind of signifying on yeah. these kind of, uh, kind of uh, you know, demeaning naming of Cato, or is it a kind of particularizing against the sort of universality uh, that you kind of describe um, as, as sort of the kind of, uh, anyway, yeah. I'm, anyway, I'm just curious. I wish I had taped everything you just said, because I'm really struggling with it, because you know, there are two things, right, or multiple things. There's what, um, Du Bois does with it, you know, in that kind of very simple sentence at the beginning of that paragraph where he really, you know, clearly wants to, to stand out. And then there's whatever uh, Jacob Burghardt was thinking when he named his son Othello. And Du Bois is really frustrating because he actually doesn't talk a lot about that Othello. I was hoping I'd go back through and I find really important kind of allusions to Othello in uh, Dark Water, but only he did the kind of same description over and over again of, of his grandfather Othello, who he called Uncle Tallow. And so there's that other thing, like you're calling him uncle, like, and I know, like we in the South, I called my grandmother Drusilla Maria, but you know, to call him Uncle Tallow also is a whole different thing as well. Um, and so I'm, I am just kind of without any um, real evidence, kind of claim, you know, presented it as a kind of a kind of bold reclamation. And I do think for, you know, even though. You know, um, it's a family that had been in freedom for several generations. You know, blacks in the diaspora are very much cut off from these longer legacies. And so I think kind of a, like it's a, it is a way to reach, as you said, a way to reach back across time and kind of, you know, make your family part of a larger history than you have actual kind of evidence for. Um, and one of the other things I'm kind of thinking about is this difference between genealogy and lineage. And um, Du Bois talks about like, you know, that every people has a need for lineage. And and it seems to me that in naming Othello, it, I mean, it's a kind of crazy lineage, but it is a lineage, right? Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I'm just, I'm playing around with it. I don't know where I'm landing. I'm, I'm trying to be, um, uh, what am I trying to be? I'm trying to be, um, I'm trying to be bolder than I am, you know, used to in terms of kind of just, I'm just kind of going to make some claims about some of it. And I also should say that a lot of this is, you know, my drive to this is kind of seeing my relationship and my kinship with these people I'm reading about. I had to cut out my section because I got so into uh, Richard Harrison. I had to cut out the section on Henrietta Vinton Davis, who was the first black female Shakespeare elocutionist who was born in Baltimore like I was born in Baltimore. And so I do feel this. Yeah. 
Baltimore represent. So, um, so I feel this kinship, and I guess I'm partly trying to, you know, as you know, someone myself who loves Shakespeare, but also, you know, wants to work towards Black freedom ever more now. Um, to, to, to think about how they, you know, do it. And, and I'm, in some ways, I am going to just kind of, you know, impose my sensibilities on them. I think they'll be all right with it. But, you know, so yeah, so you're, you, you got at the kind of heart of what I'm trying to kind of, you know, get at. Yeah. Um, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, talking about kinship, the uh, play that Harrison became famous for, Green Pastures, mm -hmm. is in Black English. And... Um, Sometimes um, the profound Shakespearean language uh, and its messages um, can be seductive, but it's surprising if you do look at green pastures, there is a certain seduction in the uh, something that you would have kinship with, possibly hmm. black English. For example, the Lord is uh, taking uh, the Israelis to the promised land. And there's a lot of music and a lot of dancing. But if you look at the um, actual dialogue, there are places in the, in the play that are quite profound. At one point, um, Moses is having all kinds of doubts. And he says to the Lord, I ain't much, Lord. That's all I is. Mm -hmm. And the Lord looks at him. And the Lord is someone who said biblically, I am that I am, which is one of the most profound parts of uh, mm -hmm. the Old Testament, I think. And Moses had just said the same thing. I ain't much, Lord. So. I am what I am. So there's probably something that you can harvest from uh, studying green pastures yeah, that you would have kinship with. <laughs> there's so much going on in that. Um, and yeah, thank you for that. And I, you know, it's it's a it's a good reminder. Um, one of the things you find in the black press, in particular, is a great deal of argument about the black English because you know the writer is a white writer approximating black English, and it seems kind of almost universal in both the white and black press that it's Barry's training and performance that makes it into something that's not a caricature. That's something that's really this powerful and moving. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, and that, that he's kind of given credit for just elevating it beyond anything. And he's and the writer pretty much said Richard you know, Harrison's the reason I won the Pulitzer Prize and and other. And there's there's are you know, people say, I know what it looks like, but you have to go see Richard Harrison in the cast uh, because they know people will be very suspicious of a play, you know, written that kind of, that, that it's a, that suspicious that it's another form of minstrelsy. And the other thing about uh, Harrison is that he really didn't want to do it um, because he was worried it was blasphemous. And he tells a long story about actually meeting with, it, with a minister who said, you've got to do this. This is important for the race. It's important for you. And um, uh, so it, it was a kind of, uh, that, that fame was really vexed for him because it, was a, it wasn't a, the fame that he wanted. It wasn't what he wanted to be famous for, but he clearly enjoyed it. Um, it occurs oh, to me, don't, yeah. you didn't know who received the microphone, so I'll stand up to make it easier. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned Ira Aldridge, and I wanted to circle back to him. Yeah. I, I thought of him when you mentioned Harrison's uh, tragic quest for community, it sounds like. Um, and, and when he was also talking with Frederick Douglass, this moment of contact where he finds someone similar to him with a connection to, to Shakespeare. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about other points of contact, either with Aldridge or other black actors. Um, does Harrison find that network aside from founding companies? And, and if yeah. it's not literal, if we don't have right. correspondence, is there a sense of lineage even when we get, get up to Paul Robeson harkening back to yeah. these earlier actors? Yeah. Um, and as a quick, yeah. No, go ahead. If sorry. I can slip it one more, is there a sense of rivalry since they're occupying a unique space right. um, as well? Because I can imagine it'd be um, uh, helpful to find another actor who, who shares something of your background and then also at the same time since you're competing for roles in stage space where yeah. it's already hard to come by uh -huh. um, if that would be something that manifests itself in any form that, yeah. that you've seen in the archives. Okay, I didn't hear the last sentence but I, I think I got the gist okay. and you can correct me if I didn't. So. Um, 
he, it, he in the in the epilogue, well, it's not an epilogue, but it's his kind of final thoughts on his life. He he talks about kind of other performers who he finds um, compelling, and he mentions Henry to Benton Davis, and he's really mentioning kind of people who are very contemporary. And one of the things I'm trying to figure, and I haven't read, there's a four volume biography of Aldrich, which I have to read. Um, because in part, a lot of these Othello retellings are also narratives about, about Ira Aldridge or narratives about the African Grove Theater. So there are lots of, there's, um, there's a play by Ossie Davis that was uh, commissioned by the Ira Aldridge Society called Curtain Call, uh, Mr. Aldridge. It was performed in a lot of black schools and um, uh, seemed quite popular in its time. Um, and I don't see any reference to Aldridge in, um, in what I saw at the Schomburg, but I'm hoping the, the finding aid of the Greensboro collection seems really rich. Like he has um, drawings of Inigo Jones's uh, 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 stagings of Johnson plays. He's got, you know, he's got a lot. He seems to have a lot of kind of ephemera from the period and, and a playbill. So I don't know what I'll find in there about his relationship to Aldridge. And I also, it also seems to me that. A lot of people were not aware as clearly um, the history and importance of Aldridge as we are now. So if you look in the Aldridge Society records, there's a lot of conversation about like how to make this guy known and a lot of, and in the press, um, a lot of kind of, um, argument over like where Aldrich was born and where he performed and what his key roles were. So it seems it's it seems in at least in the black circles, well, you know, they are pulling together his life and realizing that he's kind of the iconic figure that he that we know him to be now. But and I was actually kind of surprised I just kind of assumed everybody knew Aldrich and he was kind of known. But um it seemed to be a kind of passion for collecting Aldridge, you know, things like there's a whole correspondence about who lost Aldridge's sword he used to play Othello. Um, so I don't see Harrison. So I have actually, I didn't show it because I was already going too long, but I have a, a little kind of uh, schematic that I'm using for some of these figures. And there's, and Aldridge's to me is interesting for this question of lineage that Benji brought up because so many, so many actors post Aldridge in the 20th, in the later 20th century are harking back to, um, to Aldridge as their predecessor. So, and, and people in, just kind of ordinary people. So in, a, in some of the, um, papers of Amanda Aldrich, which seem scattered all over the place. People write her and say how thrilled they are about Paul Robeson and that he worked with her. And so therefore he's, you know, the kind of the inheritor of Aldrich. So they are creating a kind of black theatrical lineage that goes from um, Aldrich to Amanda Aldrich, who was a, uh, who was a quite known teacher of elocution and of, of music and of singing, um, a vocal coach rather, and, and then to Robeson itself. And so black people are kind of making this kind of theatrical lineage out of Aldridge once more and more people know about it. But um, but yeah, I'm kind of thinking about this Harrison question. Sorry, you needed me to shut up there. Not at all. Now I'm going to move us to more informal discussion now because we have a, a reception that awaits us and uh, I think uh, it's time for a glass of wine and some, some snacks. Uh, let's thank Kim Hall for a wonderfully wide-ranging discussion. Thank you.